the morning. So where was he when Gardner the gardener discovered the body of his wife in the pool? Well, after getting in at midnight with a two and six month old child, um, having passionate sex with the woman he was just arguing with at Superlube and at the gate, then by his own admission, arguing again in the middle of the night around 4 a.m., this defendant gets up, packs up that black Yukon, takes the two girls still in their jammies, and he's still wearing the clothes that he had on the night before, and they leave town at 8 a.m. So where does he go so early in the morning after such a late night with these two little kids? He first heads toward the home of a witness by the name of Martha Moore. Martha Moore is a woman with whom the defendant has a child, and she has kept his girls that he had with the victim, Sam Refrosh. She's kept the girls for him before. And on the way, once he leaves the gate, you'll see him leave the gate of Golden Eagle at 8 a.m. The first call he makes after he leaves the home that morning is to Martha Moore. And at the time, the phone location evidence is consistent with him traveling toward Ms. Moore's residence. And he tells Ms. Moore, I'm on my way to your house. And she says, no, you're not. I'm not there. I'm out of town. At that time, the defendant changes his plan. He goes to an auto parts store and buys a gas cap, and you'll hear a little bit more about that gas cap later. Um, he says that was for his wife's vehicle. Um, he tells Martha, I forgot to mention when he was speaking to Martha, he tells her that he is giving his wife a break from the children, and he's, going to, he's thinking of taking them to Miami for a couple days. After talking with Martha, he goes to the Pet Boys Auto Parts store, purchases a gas cap, and he's on surveillance there, which, which you'll get to see. Um, then rather than heading to Miami, he heads toward Panama City, and we're able to verify this through the phone location information. On the way, he makes several calls, one of which is to a witness by the name of Luis Torres, to whom the defendant makes the statement, something really bad happened. He also leaves several voicemails for his wife, which you'll get to hear. Um, she doesn't answer the phone and she doesn't have any phone activity um, after he leaves the house or even throughout the course of that night before. Once in Panama City, he stops at Wells Fargo Bank where he withdraws $5,000 in cash, which you'll see a, a video of that as well. He eventually gets a call from his friend, Kendall Lindsay who advises him that his wife, Kendall, has heard that his wife, Sam Refrosh, has been found dead in the pool at the Inverness Drive address. Interestingly, after being told of his wife's death, the defendant calls his wife again and leaves another voicemail. And you'll get to hear that voicemail. It's not, where the heck are you? Somebody just told me you're dead. <coughs> So officers have learned that the defendant has a residence in Panama City, Florida. The Bay County Sheriff's Office is made aware of this, and they arrive at his residence in Panama City to observe the defendant, who appears to be loading items into the back of the black Yukon. The defendant is interviewed at the Bay County Sheriff's Office, and he makes statements, statements including that his wife was hung over that morning, and that she asked him to take the kids to give her a break. Um, now remember, she had sole custody of the kids, so he was in violation of a court order being in possession of the kids that day. He also offers statements about what he thinks happened to his wife, and one of the statements he makes is that he sure hopes she didn't trip over that hose why? Because she wears these cheap flip-flops and the little dog runs around the pool and sometimes you have to chase the dog around the pool and if she tripped over that hose and those cheap flip-flops, she could have fallen and hit her head and fell in the pool and drowned because she's not a very good swimmer. Well, that's an interesting statement because the guys in Bay County didn't know anything about a hose or a flip-flop or a dog. But at the scene back in Tallahassee at Inverness Drive, there was in fact a hose, a dog, a loose dog, a 
if y'all can see that. And a flip flop. One inside the pool and one right there on the step, as you can see, tucked nicely under the hose. Nobody had said anything to him, this man that had nothing to do with his wife's death, about the hose or the flip flop or the dog when he made those statements. The only problem is the medical examiner says that this could not have been an accident. You can't fall and bump your head on two different sides of your head with the amount of force that would be required to cause the injuries that she had. And once she acquired those injuries, she would not be capable of getting herself into the pool. The officers that interviewed the defendant noticed that he had some scratches on his body. Most notably, and you were asked about this in jury selection, this scratch to his eye, just under his eye, and he indicates that the baby was the one that gave him that scratch. There are some other scratches noticed on his body that were photographed and that you'll get to see, minor scratches on his hand, his abdomen, his arms, which he indicate occur just from him just doing normal life. He always has scratches on him. Um, so he says the baby did this, but as part of the autopsy, fingernail scrapings and clippings were taken from the victim and those were sent to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement where they were analyzed by a DNA expert. And those results were that Samra Frosch had her husband's DNA under her left hand fingernails. And while there was no injury to her genital area, they also do a sexual assault kit. Um, his semen was found both in her vagina and in her anus. And when the victim's blood was tested as part of the autopsy results, um, they test the blood and the urine and the vitreous, which is the fluid inside the eyeball, <coughs> for the presence of alcohol, she was completely negative, zero alcohol. A woman that was up at 4 a.m. drunk had no alcohol in her system. You will hear from someone that the defendant confessed to, and this is our witness that I gave you a hint about in jury selection that has the felony convictions. Um, it will be up for you to you know, decide whether this witness is credible. I would ask you to give his testimony a chance, and we do have a couple things to offer as to how his, his testimony fits with the other evidence in the case. Um, there may be some other neighbors who might testify about things that they saw in the case as well, but at the conclusion of the evidence, the law, once you get the, all the evidence and the law, and apply your common sense, which I would ask you to please not check at the door today and for the rest of the week, um, all of these things will point you to a single verdict. There is only one verdict in this case that will speak the truth, and that is a verdict of guilty as charged. Thank you. Mr. Taylor. Folks, this is my one opportunity to address you as to what I believe the evidence in this case will show. What you've heard is a series of events that occurred, but I suggest to you that from competent evidence that will be presented through experts and the state's own medical examiner, the issue in this case for you to decide is not only what killed Ms. Frosch, but when was she killed? Because the evidence will show without question that from 8 a.m. on the morning of the 22nd of February 2014, my client, Dr. Frosch, was not in Golden Eagle, was not in the house, and wasn't around the swimming pool. In fact, the evidence will show from the state's own evidence that he left Golden Eagle with the two young children at around 8 a.m. and he ended up on video at Pet Voice where he made a purchase for a gas cap for a car 
his wife's car, that it had problems, which is why it was at the repair shop the night before, to the wee small hours of the evening, the late hour evening. From there, he goes to Panama City, and we can track that through cell phone evidence. Cell phone towers will show Dr. Frosch utilizing his cell phone or phones en route from Tallahassee all the way to Panama City where they have a, a residence on the beach. And he arrives, now we know there's a time change when you go to Panama City, you pick up an hour. But he's going to be seen and he is there from 9.30 or 10 o'clock in the morning on the 22nd. So he is hours away from Tallahassee, 100 miles. The body is found at 11 a.m., some three hours after Dr. Frosch leaves his residence. The medical examiner is going to testify that she cannot pinpoint the time of death within more than a, maybe an eight-hour or less window. Okay. So, according to that expert testimony, from say 3 a.m. until 11 a.m., the death could have occurred. Well, we know Dr. Frosch wasn't there from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m., so that's three hours. Three hours. That leaves a five-hour window for the state to suggest that that's when the homicide must have occurred. Ms. Frosch was found in the swimming pool. She'd been in the water. She's found at 11 o'clock in the morning. You'll hear testimony from some of these first responders that when they brought her up out of the pool, she was limp and loose. There was no such thing as what's called rigor mortis affecting her body. There was no other indications that she had been in the water for a very long time. Ms. Kappelman said, don't check your common sense at the door. Agreed. If any of you, me, anyone in this room have ever been in a bathtub, a swimming pool, the Gulf of Mexico, a river, or the ocean, for more than 20, 30, or 40 minutes, what happens to your fingers? They wrinkle. What happens to your toes? They wrinkle. Medical examiner is going to testify she found no evidence of wrinkling on either the feet or the fingers of the deceased. The first responders, I suggest to you, were so convinced she hadn't been in the water long and it was cold water, they spent 49 minutes, 49 minutes at the house trying to revive Mrs. Frosch. Well, maybe it was 15 or 20 minutes too long she'd been in the water. Maybe the five to seven minutes the gardener ran around in the front yard instead of jumping in the pool made a difference. Maybe the three, four, or five minutes that the officer went looking for the kids and didn't bother to get her out of the pool made a difference. The one thing that the evidence doesn't show is that my client was there from any time after 8 a.m. that morning. So that leaves us with the question, how do we pinpoint more accurately when she went in the water? The state wants to suggest that their evidence will show beyond a reasonable doubt it had to be between 3 a.m. and 8 a.m. The defense will suggest to you that reasonable doubt is <laughs> you can't rule out 6, 7, 7, 30, 8, 9. Well, you start with 8, 8, 8, 30, 9, 9, 30, 10, 10, 30. The defense will present a witness, this is listed I think on the states as well, a Mr. Christensen, who's going to testify, he's got no interest in this case. He's walking through the neighborhood on that morning. <clears throat> He's pretty accurate as to his time because of some calls and stuff that went on and 
interaction with another neighbor. He's with his daughter, Lauren. They walked by the Frosch house. They often noticed the house. There were a lot of cars that used to get parked in the driveways. And as he and his daughter are walking by at 10.32 a.m., 10.32 a.m., they look down and they see a slender, black haired, African American type, model type figure moving or taking something out of a black SUV. Well, the state represented, <coughs> rep referenced the white SUV that <coughs> Ms. Frosch owns. Close look at the picture, the SUV has got black on the back, uh, black by the back rear window, it's got black on the back tailgate area and as you're looking down from the street, and there's a photograph that will show it, that vehicle could easily look to be a black vehicle. And it's at 10.32 in the morning. Mr. Christensen cannot come in here and tell you under oath beyond a reasonable doubt that the woman he saw was in fact Mrs. Frosch at her residence. There's no other evidence, however, that the state has that anybody else, much less a slender looking black model figure, entered through the gates to Golden Eagle, lives in the neighborhood, or was ever there on that day. That's Mr. Christensen's testimony. State's been concerned about that. I think they called them back at least two times, maybe three, to try to see, are you sure that's, that's what you saw? Maybe it was a different date. Facts are facts. Unlike the witness the state just referred to that they'll be bringing on, the one with the conviction, or maybe it's convictions, multiple, multiple, multiple convictions. You'll have to judge as jurors whether or not to believe the credibility of the Christiansons of the world or the Folsoms of the world, that is the state's witness, of an alleged confession or statement by the defendant. What is clear, when the defense continues with its case and brings to you an expert, Dr. Jonathan Arden, a medical examiner in Virginia, who has reviewed and gone through all the documents in the case that are relevant to a finding to answer the ultimate question, when did Mrs. Frosch pass? Was it 11 o'clock, 10.30, 9, 8? Or as the state has to have you believe, beyond a reasonable doubt, before 8 a.m., maybe 7 a.m., maybe 6 a.m., maybe 5 a.m., He's going to talk to you about wrinkling, how long it takes, even in 58 degree weather, which is what the water, which is what the water temperature was. Liver mortis, rigor mortis, all of which was not present in the body of Mrs. Frosch. And I suggest to you the conclusion of the case, the competent, substantial evidence you will have is not that this defendant, Dr. Adam Frosch, killed his wife, but that something or someone did, and it occurred well before, well after, excuse me, well after 8 a.m. based on scientific evidence and proof. And at that point in time, the only verdict that will speak the truth in this case, because the state cannot prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt, is not guilty. This is not a popularity contest. It was terrible to have to see the picture of Samra Frosch and one of the babies. It's going to be terrible to have to go through this trial for you, for all of us. These cases are never fun. But there are a number of victims in this case, including the two children, Mrs. Frosch, the defendant, the father of those two kids, and the family. Issue is, are you convinced beyond a reasonable doubt she was killed by the defendant and killed before 8 a.m.? Answer, no. Thank you.